Hello, everybody. Welcome. I'm here. I hope you can see me. I have my grandson today, so forgive me. <laughs> and we got people coming in. I have an update for you and you're not gonna like it. <laughs> I'll just wait a few minutes for everybody to get on. <sighs> Does anybody have anything that they want to ask me while we're waiting just for a few people to get on? I figured we wait a couple minutes and then I'll get right into the legislative update. <laughs> just saying. Nobody has anything? Can you guys hear me at least? Type me something. Say something somewhere so I know you're there. I can see that you're in the room but I just don't know if you have questions because I have some for you. All right, can everybody hear me okay? Everybody's good? Okay, I'm gonna, oh, we got more people coming on. Just wanna give you guys all a really interesting update just received today. LA County, the entire county has extended their no eviction moratorium to February 28th. So here we go into February, no evictions in all of LA County. Youch, um, where do I see this going? I get asked this question a lot. I don't know the answers. My crystal ball's broken, but here's reality. Are our hospitals like inundated right now? Are the ambulances being told that not to bring critical patients to the hospital? <laughs> I mean, let's, let's really look at this as a big hole here. Right now is when we're getting hit the hardest with the COVID stuff thus far, okay? I don't wanna say this is the hardest we're gonna be hit because again, I don't know. But with our hospitals being inundated, our ambulance is being told, don't bring critical patients to the hospital. You know, we need people that have a fighting chance, so to speak, and how they gave them the authority to determine who's critical and who's not is beyond me. But hey, um, I have this to say. If we think for one hot minute that the moratorium to do evictions will end in February, you're probably sadly mistaken. Just saying. I have a feeling that this will get extended yet again. I mean, we're just now seeing the high numbers and we've been in a no eviction moratorium since March and we're just now being impacted by this illness the hardest. So I anticipate that they're gonna extend that for quite some time. It's not gonna, go away quickly, okay? Um, so as of right now, the no eviction moratorium for all of LA County, so any property that is within the county of LA um, is now to February 28th of this year and the likelihood of that being extended in my opinion is high. I mean, look at the state of the issue right now. We're fighting it the hardest. Hospitals are putting up tents. I mean, yeah. For those of us outside of LA County, please make sure you have your 15 day notices in place. Your 15 day notice to pay rent or quit for the month of January is most important. The reason that I'm saying this is because this is the month <laughs> that it matters. This is when they have to pay that 25% of the rent due from September through January. And if they don't pay it, you should be able to start an eviction on February the 1st. Remember our 15 day notices cannot count weekends or holidays. So the sooner you serve them, the better you are. Um, yesterday was the very first day of the month you could serve a 15 day notice to pay rent or quit and it be valid. It is the very first day of the month of January that rent could be considered delinquent. Okay, we had holidays, we had weekends, rent's not due until the first business day of every month. So just a little reminder, um, if you haven't done your January 15 day notices to pay rent or quit, you wanna make sure you get those served no later than Friday. 
Um, I'm not telling you to do them all today because I know it's short notice and half the day's gone already, but you wanna make sure that those are all served on or before Friday, just so that they expire at the right amount of time so that you can pursue an eviction if need be, if that 25% of the rent is not paid. Um, make sure you're also turning in the declaration with that to the tenant that they sign and return to you. And also the Tenant COVID Tenant Protection Act, which on or before January 28th, mark my words, we will have an update. I'm sorry, the 29th the 29th of January by close of business, we will have an update on how exactly they are going to extend AB 3088, which is the COVID Tenant Protection Act that expires at the end of this month. I have no doubt it will be extended to how long, I don't know, but I have other questions, okay? <laughs> Just stay with me here. There's talk of extending AB 3088 regarding the 75% of the rent that's due. For these five months, September, October, November, December, and January, only 25% of the rent is due on or before the 31st of this month. And the balance is actually due when the bill expires on February 1st. They're talking of extending that to February 1st of 2022, okay? If they extend that to February 1st of 2022, my question becomes, What's going to happen with February, March, April, May, June, and July's rent? And the reason I say that is they seem to be writing these laws in five to six month increments. Okay, based on what they've done previously, I'm just saying, because again, I don't know, but it does look like they are writing them in increments of five to six months. The first one we saw was six months. Um, that would be March's rent through the end of August rent. That rent is now considered consumer debt and can never be evicted for, can never be served a notice for. You can only sue them in small claims for that money, but not until March of this year. So what's gonna happen with the upcoming rents? How long can our owners hold on before they're faced with foreclosure, notice of default, notice of trustee sale? I mean, it's all getting a little bit scary for lack of a better way for me to explain it. Um, there are programs out there that are helping tenants pay their rent. I suggest that you find out as much information about them while you can. Encourage your tenant to apply for them. I don't believe a landlord can apply for this, only the tenant. So my biggest concern is, and this is me talking to you out loud, is throughout this process, We've been told by our multifamily communities that their mail rooms are inundated worse than Black Friday. So people have been spending money online, Amazon shopping, they don't have anything else to do, <laughs> okay? I'm just saying. So we wanna make sure that we have, here's my grandson. Hi, honey. Okay, go back, go back and do your project. Okay, thank you, sorry. Okay. Anyway, to get back on track, I'm very, very concerned with how this is gonna implement and affect our homeowners that are being faced currently with notices of default and things of that nature. Um, I don't see a bailout for them. Hopefully they initiate something so that we don't lose our investment properties because of this pandemic. Um, and my, my big key thing is, well, if they do foreclose on us as owners, then the bank's going to foreclose on the tenant. And then I'm thinking, no, maybe the government will force the bank to keep that tenant there. Who knows? Okay. <laughs> but we'll figure that out as we go along, because that's all we can do at this point, because we're not driving. COVID-19 is. Okay, why'd you um, what questions can I answer for you guys today? Is there something that I can address or answer with you guys today? Um, does anybody have anything that they want to talk about? Nobody, nothing. Hold on, honey. You can have the applesauce. Absolutely. <laughs> Sorry, you guys. And if you're talking to me, I can't hear you. So unmute yourself in the bottom left corner or type your response there and where you can type in chat to me. If you got anything you want to talk about, any questions you might have, the LA no eviction moratorium for LA County has been extended to February 28th. The chances of that being extended again, in my opinion, are very high. 
60 day notices. You want to know if you can serve a 60 day notice to terminate tenancy. Everybody wants to know. Um, it depends on what county you're in. And I'll leave my statement at that. In LA County, what the moratorium says is that the landlord can't even endeavor to evict. What does that mean in English? On terms we can understand, it means you can't even think about it. You can't even serve the notice. So in LA County right now, you can't even serve the notice for them to get out when the moratorium expires. So if you're in LA County and you wanna terminate tenancy, it's gonna be extremely challenging for you. If you're not in LA County, I definitely talk to your legal counsel, but I'm pretty sure you're not gonna be able to just serve a normal notice to terminate tenancy. Um, because of AB 3088, we have to have reasons that are listed under AB 1482. What did I just say in English? Because <laughs> I know it's a lot of numbers, forgive me. The Tenant COVID Protection Act protects tenants from being evicted right now. Okay, as nicely as I could say, it, it protects tenants from being evicted right now. They say that the only reason we can terminate tenancy is with cause, and that cause being described to us from the statewide rent control initiative. That would be AB 1482. So for cause, landlord wants to move in directly. Uh, landlord has a family member that wants to move in. Major renovations are going to be done. And in the event you are doing major renovations, I gotta open the applesauce, sorry guys. <laughs> in the event you are doing the major renovations, you better have the permits pulled prior to uh, even serving the notice because they are going to check. And that's what they mean by major renovations. It's gotta be extensive. It's gotta be massive. Let me see, I thought I saw something else come through. Um, we don't have any new updates for Orange County, San Bernardino County. It's just LA County that's extended the moratorium. Right now, we're being controlled and governed by AB 3088, which basically says if we want to evict right now, we have to have cause, okay? Cause is not the rent, okay? Cause is a material breach of the lease, but it's got to have a lot of teeth in there. So arrest records, nuisances, things of that nature, uh, damages to the property, um, things of that nature. Uh, so we can evict for cause, but not for non-cause at this point, um, unless the owner wants to move in. You can't just say, I want my house back. We've kind of lost that privilege right now. I hope we get it back. <laughs> but right now we've lost that privilege. So at this point, again, it becomes extremely tricky on how we move forward. Building a case on cause is the hard way to do it, but, um, Everything, a demur, Mr. Wilson, hello. A demur is a stalling tactic for lack of a better term. And I'll give you a little bit of insight on what a demur is. Um, and I'll make it as simple as I could explain it. Let's say that I'm married to Joe Smith and Joe Smith and I are married and we have an argument and he files an eviction against me. And my name's on title of that house, <laughs> okay? You can't evict an owner unless you're a bank foreclosing, right? You can't evict somebody that's on title. So you would file a demur with the court to have the court look at the basis of the eviction to see if it has valid validity or not. It's very simple. Usually tenants use a demur as a stalling tactic just to buy more time in the premises. It has no teeth, the demur is heard. It's either opposed, deny, move forward. If you're moving forward, again, it's just a stalling tactic to throw at a landlord, unfortunately. Um, and there's quite a few of them out there. We are starting to see a lot more of those stalling tactics that they use in LA County, LA City especially. Um, we're starting to see them come more inland. So we're seeing demurs being filed in Barstow and Joshua Tree and things of that nature. Um, tenants are getting educated on how the system works and how to manipulate the system, how to buy time at your expense. <laughs> it's not fair. All right, let me see. There's some more questions coming through. I hope that answered your question about a demur. No changes in Orange County yet. Eviction moratorium. What about the 15 day notice to pay rent or quit and they've not paid the 25%? 
yes, they can file a second demur, uh, John Wilson. They can file a demur on each issue that they find ar arising. They can file a demur. They can file a motion to quash. They can file all kinds of stuff as stalling tactics. It's not fun. Uh, eventually, the court could get sick of it and basically put a stop to it. Um, but usually, that happens after three times. I know, three is too many. Hold on, I saw another question and I lost it. Eviction moratorium. What about the 15 day notice to pay rent or quit and they have not paid the 25%? Please let me remind you, the 25% of the rent that is due is for September, October, November, December, and January. Those five months only, 25% of the rent is due on or before January 31st. So they have until the 31st to pay that 25%. If they don't pay it, you should be able to continue with an eviction on February 1st. That is your cause, okay? Everybody with me? When you do your 15 day notice to pay rent or quit, do not put the 25% of the rent on there. Put the full amount of the rent on there, okay? You're asking for the full amount of the rent. If they pay the 25%, we have no choice but to allow things to continue forward. But we wanna put the full amount of the rent that's owed on the notice. Okay, hold on, let me see something. If you're in the middle of an eviction process and you accept payment at all of any kind for anything without your attorney's approval or without it being court ordered from the judge, it voids your eviction. So if they send you money, unfortunately, you need to return it. I know you didn't want to hear that answer, but it's the reality. It will void your eviction entirely. I hope that answered your question. And if people have more questions, ask them, because I am yours today. The only update I had for you was LA County extended their moratorium and on or before the 29th of this month, we will have an update on 3088. Um, they're most likely going to extend the 75% to be due February 1st of next year, 2022. And they're probably going to do something regarding the next five or six months of rent that's upcoming for February, March, April, May, June, and July. Um, we'll probably see some verbiage in there, maybe another 25% thing, who knows. Um, haven't heard much talk of what they're doing as far as that's concerned um, or how they're gonna play that one out, but I am watching it diligently because I wanna be able to report to you guys what we're up against. If you have not received a decrease in payments, <laughs> if you will, if you haven't gotten some help from your lender on making that mortgage payment, you may want to call them and see what we can do. The reason I'm saying that is in the beginning of COVID in March, April, and May, everybody was trying to help everybody. Credit card companies, banks, June hit and they all stopped helping or stopped advertising help or stopped reaching out to us. And this really didn't start totally affecting us in my personal opinion until September hit and the Tenant COVID Protection Act came into play because that's when over half their states, half their states um, tenants stopped paying the rent. So we as landlords are really feeling that. I can tell you this, if you have an apartment community and you have two or three people that aren't paying you the rent, don't focus there. Make sure everything else is running smoothly. You have the whole building to operate. You can't focus. Remember, their rent's not due yet, so we can't keep poking them. It's not due. So what we want to do there is focus on making sure our vacants are rented as soon as possible. Get ready for the concession wars. We're already seeing some of the prices for residential rentals dropping. Okay, they're no longer increasing. Now they're starting to drop. I have a feeling we're going to see the concession wars starting. You know, we're going to go back to the $99 moves you in. 
I'm not saying that's going to happen tomorrow, but we're going to start to see that ball rolling. I'm already seeing it with corporate America and things of that nature. The concession walk, the concession wars have begun. So we're starting to see rents come down a little bit. We're starting to see move-in incentives. We're starting to see move-in specials. We're starting to see decreases on security deposit amounts. Let me just give you guys a solid so, and I hope you're paying attention to the words coming out of my mouth. When you give away rent, it's gone. When you lower the security deposit, that wasn't ever your money anyway. Technically, you're just holding it. It's the tenant's money and you are to return it to them. So if you lower a security deposit on approved credit, meaning you feel that they're not gonna jeopardize their credit, he, taking a lower security deposit is a really good business practice because technically that's not your money and you're not losing any money and it makes it less expensive for the person coming in to get into the unit. So just something to think about. And when you start lose, lowering your rents, don't do it in $100 increments, do it in 15 to $50 increments. 15 to $15, 15 to $50 increments is a much better business practice for lowering the rent to get somebody into a property rather than taking it down 100. Remember, by taking it down $100, $100, $100, you're only hurting yourself. If you can get some it down $15 so you are less expensive than everybody else, then you're ahead of the game. So just something to think about when you're dealing with your vacants. If we can stop the bleeding and control it somewhere, it's going to be within our vacant units. Our vacant units is what we can control. The tenants that aren't paying us, we can't control that right now. We just have to turn it to the back burner, do our job, serve our notices, and leave them alone. Stop poking at them. Okay, go after filling up your vacants, getting those up rented. If you have to offer concessions, then offer concessions. What am I saying? Uh, Move-in special, a discount, um, five hundred dollars off the first month's rent if you move in by the fifteenth. Things like that. Um, we're going to see a lot more of that because from what I'm starting to see in here across the board is rentals are becoming stagnant right now and pricing is going to start decreasing. Um, it went up and it shouldn't have as quickly as it did, but it did. And now we're all going to have to make it work. Okay, hold on. I'm, I'm reading. Any possibility of rental increase in the near future? Not at this time. And I'm being completely honest with you. Um, and and I'll, say, I'll say it like this, and I know you guys have heard me say it before, but it's the best way that I could protect you, is they can't tell us we have to shelter in place and the landlord raising the rent. It would be like saying, if you can't sell your investment property, but we're raising the payment on you. That's not cool, <laughs> okay? So same concept. Um, we still haven't heard from the Department of Fair Housing yet over when is a reasonable amount of time to increase rents or terminate tenancy after a global pandemic and it not be considered retaliation. So we still have that issue there. So let me read a couple more questions. Should I put the home for sale in the middle of eviction process with the reason being I need to move my kids into the home? Um, you could put the home up for sale in the middle of an eviction process, but if you're selling it, are you selling it to your kids? Or are you just terminating tenancy so your kids can move in? <laughs> so a little confused there, it's okay. Um, and if you're in currently in the middle of an eviction, that's fine. You just wanna make sure you assign the eviction through escrow so that the buyer can continue forward. In LA County, if we serve the 15 day notices and the tenants don't pay the 25% by January 31st, now that the moratorium was extended, does this mean that they cannot be evicted until February 28th minimum? Actually, it would be they can't be evicted until March 1st on the minimum or in the event you have cause, you can do that um, right now. People that have cause can evict in LA now. Um, we're talking about murder, death, suicide, police reports. It's gotta be bad. It's gotta have big, big teeth. 
how do we determine the market rent at this time? There's a couple of ways that you can determine the market rent. Zillow seems to be somewhat accurate. And I always like to come in a little bit under what Zillow is estimating the rents at. You can also ask a real estate agent to do a comparative market analysis for you. That will look at the market over the last six months or so, depending on what you're asking them to do. And they can pull up comp space in your area as well. So any real estate agent should be able to do that for you. Um, it's called a CMA or comparative market analysis. Um, and they should be able to tell you what current market value is. I would say stay under current market value. If your current market value is $3,500 a month, put it up for $3,100 a month. You can ask all you want for $3,500. What we want is somebody to pay that. So if we're a little bit less than market value, we look better at the end of the day and we'll probably get it rented faster rather than the latter of the two. Um, when I have a vacant, I want to get it rented as quickly as possible because I'm bleeding money, especially in single family residence. Um, it's one for one, you know, you're either everything's going perfect no. and you're bleeding. There's no middle ground with the single family residence. It's not like you have several other apartments that can help float the mortgage. Uh-uh, it's all you. <laughs> so when you get into that single family residence, I'm extremely aggressive on getting that property re-rented as quickly as possible so that we can stop that financial bleeding, reboot, reload, etc. It looks like I had another question come in. Oh, some Connie says they use Rentometer. So yes, you can try that as well. Um, and again, I would come in a little bit lower at whatever it's saying. If it's saying you could get $1,500 a month, I would probably list mine at $1,395. So I'm $105 lower than what everybody else typically would be asking. Um, and that's just because I want a tenant in there because that helps me stop that bleeding. Don't lower your rent so low and so quickly that the quality of applicant that you're getting isn't good. So sometimes that becomes a challenge too. If we make our house too inexpensive, it attracts people that aren't qualified. Okay, just saying. Um, also make sure you have your criteria on the front of all your applications and in any advertisement you're doing, that is your first line of defense in a discrimination lawsuit regarding choosing tenants and things of that nature. So you wanna make sure you have your criteria in place. That's a great way to protect yourself. It also gives that applicant the idea of what they need to have in order to qualify to live there. Okay? Anybody have any more questions for me? It doesn't look like I got anything else. Anybody, anybody? So just to recap very quickly, this is the month that matters for your 15 day notices to pay rent or quit. Serve them now. Make sure you serve all the other documents with it. So it's a 15 day notice, a declaration the tenant fills out, and also a tenant COVID protection relief act disclosure. So those three documents need to be served all at the same time in order for your notice to be valid. Uh, you want to include the full month's rent that's behind and only rents for September through January can be on there. Um, and then if you're in not in LA County, you most likely will be able to start an eviction if they don't pay you the 25% on or before February 1st. Hold on, I see a question from Little Miss April. Let's see what her question is. What about pending lockout? So one of the ways that LA County is enforcing the no eviction moratorium, and don't shoot the messenger, okay, because <laughs> it's BS, is they're not issuing the writ of possession at court or entering default on your behalf. That's one way the court is doing it. If you're past that point, what they're doing is the sheriff's department is going and posting the five day notice on the door for the tenant to vacate. And if they vacate in five days, hit the easy button. But what they're not doing is actually calling you to schedule that lockout. So that's how they're implementing the no evictions in LA County right now. 
is the courts aren't issuing defaults. They're not issuing writs of possession. If a writ of possession was issued and it does get to the sheriff, God love the sheriff, they're still going out there and posting the property with that five day notice. And if that scares your tenant and your tenant gets out, hit the easy button, okay? Because that is so far the easiest way. But they're not calling or scheduling a lockout date and time for you to meet them there with a locksmith is how they're enforcing that. Another thing that we need to keep in mind is from the date the writ of possession is issued until the date it expires is six months. So if this pandemic continues on this path, um, the writ could expire and we could have to go back to the court and ask them to reissue a new writ before we could do the lockout. I hope that answers your question, April. What type of liability to an owner, to a tenant's guest that gets injured on a rental property and how can it be limited? That's why you have homeowner's insurance. Okay. I'm not saying that that completely and totally protects you, but it's one of the reasons that you have homeowner's insurance is a slip and fall on the property, whether it's from a guest, whether it's from your tenant, whether it's from whomever. So your, your insurance policy, your owner's policy is what helps protect you on a liability issue within the dwelling. You can also make it a requirement that your tenant get insurance and you be listed as additional insured or interested party. Um, and usually they have a liability policy and anywhere from 300,000 to a million dollars as far as tenants go. And sometimes what happens is they go after the tenant's insurance and when they've capped that amount, depending on the severity of what happened, then they can turn around and use the owner's insurance as a backup policy. Hold on, let me see what this says. On a multifamily property, no insurance can be had unless it's rented 75%. I, I, I understand. So at that point, I would require that all my residents had renter's insurance. That would be a 30-day notice to change the terms of tenancy after the pandemic. And if you're in LA County, we need to have another conversation because, or I'm sorry, the city of LA. If you're in the city of LA, you can't change the terms of the original rental agreement unless all parties agree, other than your annual rent increase, any mandated disclosures, that would be like the bed bug disclosure, lead-based paint disclosures, asbestos disclosures, and your attorney's fees clause. Those are the only three things you can change in the city of LA and not have both parties in agreement. So rent increase, deposit increase, uh, attorney's fees clause, mandated disclosures. And there's only four things you can do in the city of LA. I hope that answered your question. But yes, I would make it a requirement. Um, so here's, here's how I run my, because I can't give you legal advice, but I can tell you what I do, okay? So what I do is I require that my tenants have renter's insurance and that I'm listed as an additional insured or interested party on their policy. That way, in the event they're gonna get terminated for non-payment, I can then serve them a three-day curable breach of covenant notice um, and require that they show me proof of insurance being reinstated, et cetera, blah, 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 blah. So it just notifies me. From a corporate level, um, you want your owners to have you as a management company listed as an additional insured or interested party. You want all of your vendors to be insured and your corporation to be listed as additional insured or interested party. It just helps protect everything that's going on. And dealing with the insurance on a big book of business where I'm talking you have $2,000 $2, doors or more, it is a full-time job just for somebody to sit there and monitor all the insurances that are coming in from your vendors, from your tenants, from your landlords. I, it's a lot, okay? But it's the best way to protect yourself. Um, I saw a couple more questions come in, so let me get to them. Just confirming they did not make any changes to charging late fees. Um, correct. You can charge a late fee right now. It has to go on a 15-day 
curable breach of covenant. Anything you're going after money-wise right now has to go on a 15-day notice. Anything, okay? Money, and I'll keep this real simple because they took away our three-day notice to pay rent or quit. They took away our three-day covenant notice for monetary issues. Um, simple English, what did I say? Your tenant has a late fee and a broken window and they owe rent. You're going to do a 15 day notice for the rent monies. And then you're going to do a 15 day curable breach of covenant for the late fee and the expense of the broken window. If you are doing things that are non-monetary, meaning there's no money involved. In other words, your tenant won't allow entry or they've made modifications to the property without written consent of the landlord, you can still use the three-day curable breach of covenant. The only time those 15-day notices come into place is when you're asking for money, nothing else, okay? And so far they haven't changed that. And I hope they give us our three-day notice to pay rent or quit back. Um, we've been fighting this for quite some time, a couple years now, and they snuck it in on us, unfortunately. Um, it's ridiculous, but it is what it is. We have to, we're no longer driving. We're along for the ride. I feel sorry for all the small businesses out there. Um, I hope that they find some kind of recourse this year, not just for the restaurants and the beauty salons, but also us as landlords. We are considered a small business. Um, so if you see any funding coming out to help small businesses through this time, that's where you want to go. Hey, you want to apply there. Uh, we need to start reaching out to our resources and getting the help that we need um, to get through this pandemic because we can't continue to hold on the way that we are. It's not fair to us. And I, I, I am so sorry <laughs> to be the bearer of bad news and tell you guys it's going to get worse before it gets better. But the reality is, look at what's happened in other countries. This is going to get worse before it gets better. <laughs> And with the new election and all those changes, we're seeing lots and lots of things um, happen. Okay, John, good news. The guy that was living in the property without my consent was a criminal and taken into custody. Hit the easy button. <laughs> Sometimes the trash takes itself out. Hit the easy button. Um, Make sure that you're posting your notice of abandonment of real property and personal property that was left on the items. And then um, if you don't hear anything, contact your legal counsel before you change the locks and take possession. Just saying you wanna be safe, not sorry. And you don't wanna get ac accused of an illegal lockout. It's very expensive. You don't wanna do that. Um, anybody have anything else they wanna discuss with me? I get asked, this question a lot. So I'm going to reiterate it as best as I can. When I tell you guys that you need to find the material breaches of your lease contract, the reality is I don't know what your rental agreement says. I haven't seen it. So it's very hard for me to tell you exactly what your rental agreement says in simple English terms. I am going to be doing a class at the end of this month called Understanding the Terms of Your Rental Agreement. It will be done through Widgets Way and all those paragraphs and all that verbiage, I'm gonna summarize for you very simply of what that means in plain simple English. A lot of landlords are reaching out right now and serving that 24 hour notice and going to make sure that they're providing habitable premises by doing that preventative maintenance inspection. If the tenant doesn't let you in, <laughs> that is a material breach of the lease. End of California Civil Code 1954. Actually, it's not 1954, I lied. No, it is 1954 because the other one is 1950. So 1954 um, has to do with entry. Sorry, lots of numbers, you guys. Small little blonde brains. Sometimes they don't get filed where they're supposed to. <laughs> Sorry, it's the way I work. Um, but basically, if you serve a written 24-hour notice to enter and they say you can't come in, they're in violation of the law. So it gives you a little bit more teeth if you're trying to evict. Um, but I'm seeing a lot of things regarding modifications to the property without written consent of the landlord. Some of the key things that I could tell you to watch for when you're looking for those modifications is mounting flat screen TVs to the wall. The TV's not yours, but
but what they attach to the foundation to hold that TV is a modification to the property without your written consent. So is painting. We see that a lot. So those are two key things to look for. Number one and number two key thing to look for is a ring doorbell system. That would be a modification without written consent of the landlord. And the number one, and we all do it, is changing the locks. I mean, we buy a new house. The first thing we do is change the locks because we don't know who has a key. We don't know which agents made keys. We don't know. So we just change the locks. Just so you know, tenants do that too. <laughs> Okay. I know I was one for quite some time. First thing you do when you move is change the locks because you don't know who has a key. Simple, right? Um, that would be a modification without written consent of the landlord. So definitely something that you should watch for if you're trying to build a case on cause. Everybody with me? Four most common things to look for. Ring doorbell systems or video camera systems. Changing the locks flat screen TVs, and painting. There's all kinds of material breaches in your lease, but you know your lease better than I do. It might say that they have to keep the yard green. And if they haven't been watering and the grass is dead, that could be a problem. Saying. So again, the end of this month, um, I'll be doing a class on understanding the terms of your rental agreement so that I could put those legal terms into simple terms that you all understand. Um, Going to ask you guys for a little bit of help wanting to know what rental contract you're using. Are you guys using CAA? Are you using AGLA? Are you using AACSCs? Is it an apartment association? Is it car forms? Let me know what the most common agreement is that you guys are using out there so I can use that one as my example when I teach the class. That way it covers pretty much what's in front of you. <laughs> It'll help me the most. I see one more question came through. We are having issues with tenants bringing in animals without permission. Notices are given and tenants are now saying they're an emotional support animal. They violated the lease agreement by not asking permission, but nothing can be done since it's an ESA animal. Is that correct? Absolutely. Something can be done, but we're gonna have to talk about that, okay? Here's how I want you to look at an emotional support animal. It is no different than a wheelchair. It is an assistive device for a disabled person, simply said. I don't know what happened. I'm trying to bring you guys all back. Are, are we here? Do you guys have me now? Something weird happened. It's like I lost everybody. Are you guys all in here? Somebody send me a message and let me know you're here. It was like I got disconnected shortly. You're here. Okay, good. What was I talking about? <laughs> Sorry, I got kicked off the Zoom meeting, but I got back on. And, but I lost my train of thought. I was answering your question, April. Okay, let me go back and look. I don't know what your question is because I had to quickly start a new Zoom. So ask me again. I got all discombobulated. I'm sorry. <laughs> We're having issues with the tenant. Oh, ESA animals. Okay, gotcha. So emotional support animals, therapy animals, service animals, they all fall under the same category and it's all has to do with the American Disabilities Act. Okay, so it's not fair housing, it's this much fair housing because fair housing wants to make sure you're not discriminating, but it's this much ADA law. And basically you're poking at somebody in a wheelchair. We don't want to do that. We don't want to tell somebody, oh, you're disabled. You can't live in my property. Can you imagine the lawsuit? Emotional support animals fall under those guidelines and they're protected on a federal level. However, those animals cannot become a nuisance. 
the tenant still has to clean up after them. They're responsible for any damages they do. And if there's excessive noise from within the unit, it's excessive noise. So we could tell them that they can't keep that animal because that animal is a nuisance on the property. They need to exchange it for a different animal that isn't a nuisance, but that is not something you wanna challenge on your own. That is something you need your legal counsel for because you're poking at a very big bear with very big teeth and you do not want that one to bite you because it's gonna hurt. <laughs> it's gonna hurt bad. Like. Let me see. I had somebody that denied an emotional support animal to an applicant and they paid $79,000 to settle out of court. $79,000 to settle out of court. Ouch. If they would have went to court, it probably would have cost them a quarter of a million. I'm just saying. It's no joke. Okay. <laughs> no joke. Um, so you want to be very careful. Think of that emotional support animal as a wheelchair just automatically as a wheelchair. Can I ask for extra rent because they use a wheelchair? No. Can I ask for an extra deposit because they use a wheelchair? No. Can I make any special rules for them because of the wheelchair? No. <laughs> so it kind of answers all your questions when you just start thinking about it. And please remember, it's an assistive device for a disabled person. How true they're being about it, I don't know. I've had a lot of owners challenge it and they end up backing off because they understand the expense involved um, of trying to fight something like that. I mean, the reality is there's good humans and there's bad humans, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Period, end of report. The good humans are gonna do what's right. They're gonna pay pet rent and say that to their pet because it's a member of their family. And the not so good human is going to manipulate the system to benefit them, simply said. Okay, <laughs> so keep that in mind. You're poking at ADA, you're poking at all kinds of stuff. From RPI Realty Publications through First Tuesday. Okay, I'd have to see the document that you use, Mark. If you wanna email me a copy of your blank rental agreement, I'd be more than happy to look that over and give you my opinion on it as to what your exposure is and what you could be missing as far as disclosures um, and things of that nature to help protect you going forward. I'd be more than happy to do that for you. Just email me that over at widget at widgetsway.com. Very simple. And I'd be more than happy to look at that for you um, and give you a couple of pointers, tips, tricks, whatever I can do to help. I'm here to help you guys. I truly am. Um, I enjoy it. <laughs> April knows. I enjoy it. Call me with your problems. I'll tell you how to fix them. <laughs> it's really hard for your, all of us, all of us, myself included, to see a way out of the hole because we're standing in the hole. Okay. So it's a little easier for somebody to come in with a different perspective and take control of that situation or give you an out to that situation that you aren't even thinking about. And it's just because you're part of the equation, nothing more and nothing less. And I'm being honest with you. I own investment property, as you well know. When my units go vacant, I have to have a friend of mine that's in the industry review the credit reports because I go into landlord mode and I'm like, I need the money, just run it to them. But you can't do that, okay? You can't. <laughs> so I have a friend in the industry that's involved in property management and she looks at my applications for me and helps me pick one because I go into landlord mode. I can do it anywhere else. I can play the game anywhere else. But for some reason, when it comes to picking an applicant, my brain goes, pick that one, get the money, get the money, get the money. And it's not the best choice. <laughs> I'm looking at it going, they have two evictions. Well, that's okay. They're not going to want a third one, right? <laughs> I need the money. The reality is, don't do it, okay? <laughs> Ask somebody else in the industry to help you. It's really hard when you have skin in the game and you're the one bleeding the money. I get it. I understand. I relate. And that's one of the reasons why I'm here is I'm here to give you guys an honest opinion. You guys may not always like the words that come out of my mouth, but know that I'm not going to sugarcoat it and I'm not gonna exaggerate it. I am a dream crusher and a bubble burster, okay? But I just wanna be flat honest with you. 
uh, you know, people come to me, oh, I'm sick of the blah, blah, blah. Hey, you want a lawsuit knocking at your door? Because those are really expensive. Let's try a different approach with this and maybe you'll get some different results. <laughs> That's why I'm here, you guys, just to help you try to bond everything together. Okay, if nobody has anything else, I'm going to end this for today. Thank you for tolerating me again. Be back next week for sure. And the end of this month, I'm going to do that class on understanding the terms of your rental agreement. Um, hopefully that helps put some insight. I mean, we read these paragraphs and we think we interpret them, but we're not too sure what some of these legal terms are, what some of these sentences mean. And that makes us not so great at our job because if we don't know what the rules are, how are we enforcing them? Okay, remember the written rules are your, is your rental agreement. So it's a very key point in any landlord tenant relationship is that you have that written agreement and that you understand the terms that are on there. All right, you guys all have a great day. I'll go ahead and end this and I'll see you next Wednesday. Bye. <laughs>